Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on our Departures Travel Lounge um, Travel Show. And we are very excited to welcome a new speaker today. But first of all, let me introduce myself, Kathy Scott. Um, I am one of the co-owners of Sydney Departures Travel, as well as the owner of Departures Travel in Oak Bay in Victoria. With us today is Kathy Larson, co-owner of Sydney Departures Travel, and we're really excited to introduce you to Dr. Peter Bobrowski, if I said that correctly. And uh, Dr. Peter is um, an expert on uh, Smith Smithsonian journeys, and he's going to be chatting with us a little bit today about, or a lot today, about um, his experiences with Around the World by Private Jet. So very excited to have you on with us, Peter, and um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Kathy and Kathy, for inviting me to do this. Um, so my background is in uh, archaeology and engineering geology. Uh, so I'm, I'm not in the travel business, but uh, I was lucky enough in my career uh, to uh, be invited to start giving talks to the public about 20 years ago. And so throughout my professional career, I also found some time to uh, go out on uh, different trips and tours and give lectures to the public that on uh, topics that were relevant to where we were going. And so um, in a nutshell, yeah, for the last 19 years, I've uh, done about 40 different trips, which uh, on land, uh, train, boats, including private jets. So today I thought I'd give you a, a little rundown about what it's like to do a private tour uh, or a private jet tour around uh, uh, when you're touring. That's really exciting. And it's something that, um, I mean, it's it, very few people have done this. So it'll be a really neat thing for our viewers to watch today. And um, so we were, we had a little quick look earlier at your presentation and both Kathy and I were um, thinking, oh my gosh, I think we're in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, let's just get going, Peter, and, and let's okay. see what you've got to show us today. Okay, well, thanks for that. So uh, first of all, uh, just to start that, I, as I said, I've done about 40 trips and eight of them were on a private jet tour in the last 18 years. I just did one last October and uh, six of the itineraries were the same. Uh, so that's the one I'm gonna highlight here and they, they tweak them slightly. So I'm just gonna go through very quickly in terms of what the stops are, what the perks are about traveling uh, on a private jet and, uh, and sort of, I hope it gives you a feel of what it's like and maybe get you interested in actually doing this. There's a good reason to do so. So uh, let's see if I can get this going. Uh, nope. Teresa, uh, I need some help. <laughs> the, uh, how do I get had, the page? We've had a few technical glitches today. Okay. There All right. Go. So the typical jet that's used is a Boeing 757. And this usually has about 240 economy seats. So what the company has done is they rip out all the seats and depending on the style of trip, uh, they put in these first class seats or business class seats. So the first class seats, uh, there's obviously fewer of them and uh, they cost more than let's say the business class trip. So here's the business class seats, they put in 76 instead of the 240. Uh, and uh, if you were going first class, they're oh. the full reclining <laughs> 180 degree seats and there's only 50 room for 52 passengers. So they, essentially do the same itinerary uh, and a uh, number of companies do this. They all come on with full service, of course. And I'll tell you who actually participates in this because it's actually exciting and amazing who comes with you on this trip. So full onboard service, just like anywhere else, great meals. Uh, most of the legs that you're actually flying are, are six to seven hours maximum. And, uh, but they don't want you to go hungry or thirsty. So they uh, have a chef on board. So there's actually, so this is the typical personnel. There's three pilots because you're going around the world. So in case they have to rest, something happens. So you've got enough pilots. We've got enough engineers in case something goes wrong and they have to do some repairs. Uh, we did on the last trip, for instance, they actually travel with a lot of the parts. So they, they already know what to replace. So we were delayed a couple hours while they had to tweak something. And, and then we just carried on. But as you can see, there's also um, six flight attendants. So that, leave, that makes it about one flight attendant for about 10 or 12 passengers. Um, there's a doctor who comes on board for the entire trip. Trips are 24 days long. And then of course, there's a, tour guide, an assistant tour guide, 
uh, and there are these advanced ground teams that I'll explain later. So there's there's behind the scenes people that you sort of meet on route all the time. It's very complex. The, the sort of machinery behind this is amazing. And then there's usually a few lectures. So I've been lucky enough to get on a few of these trips. Uh, and, and essentially what we do is we give talks on different themes, the specialists are all different, uh, that are relevant to where we're going. So this is a typical itinerary. Uh, so it starts in the US where the number one and 11 are the same place. We head down south and you can see that we fly westward. So we're always going to the west. That way we're not losing time. You're always gaining hours. So you never wake up tired and you can always have a nap on the plane. But so you're always gaining a couple hours per day uh, which lessens the burden, I think, of the journey because you're not uh, you're not going through these horrible time zone changes. Um, so I'm going to go through what these stops were quickly, give you a, the highlights of the stops, and I want to sort of show you some uh, things about how we travel when we're on the ground and uh, uh, what we see in the hotels and so on. So these are the the list in the order that we go through. Uh, most of them, I think, are sort of global bucket lists. I mean, this is sort of a one-time opportunity to see a lot of places a lot of people really don't get to, to uh, in their lifetime. Some people may have seen some of these, and what these companies do, they actually accommodate that. So, for example, if you've been to Machu Picchu, when we fly to Peru, they have a secondary option, and they send people who've been to Machu Picchu to another area. Uh, when we were in the Serengeti, for instance, if you've been to the Serengeti, when you land there, they send you to a lodge. I went to a, the crater, Norongoro crater, because I've been to Serengeti several times. So they try to accommodate the fact that maybe some of these spots on the bucket list, you don't want to repeat. They're going to give you another perk nearby. So let's just go through these quickly, if that's OK. We Everybody meets the day or so before in Port Lauderdale, get to know everyone. And then that's the last time you touch your luggage, which is fantastic. So you can bring steamer trunks full of luggage <laughs> and some people do, but really that's it. You, you won't have to do any labor, uh, like at airports and so on, you just walk in, get on the plane, get to your seat. Your luggage has been loaded. It shows up in your hotel. They pick it up the next day and so on. So it's, it's really great. So as I said, the first trip we uh, or stop, we go to Peru and we landed actually in Lima. And that's the only time where we had to give up our plane because the plane is too big to land in Cusco. So then we got, but the timing they arranged it is so that we arrived, we walked off the plane and went straight onto this other plane. They booked the entire plane for us as well. So we weren't sharing. You're never sharing anything with anybody else. It literally is a private trip. We flew commercially, but there are a couple empty seats. They don't sell them. And then we flew to Cusco. We spent a few days there, of course, sightseeing. They arrange uh, multiple activities per day. So it's not everybody doing all these together. They keep us in small groups. You have those little audio things in your ear that they explain. They have a lot of local guides. Uh, you never really feel crowded. And so you can pick and choose what you want to do during the day or sleep in and go for an afternoon trip. Uh, you're not obligated to do everything all the time. Uh, so. It's very heavy culturally oriented. You can imagine most of the sites we go to are World Heritage sites. Some of the stops have a couple of World Heritage sites. Um, a lot of times they, they seal off everything just for our group. So I'll show you some of those examples. It's unbelievable. That, so we have very literally private tours. So after tours around Cusco, the big trip is to get to Machu Picchu itself. Uh, one of my favorite places, I, I had a chance to work there for four years, so I never get tired of going back there. Um, and uh, how we got there is really spectacular as well, and I'm saving that for later in the talk. So we get out to Machu Picchu, we go back to Cusco after a few days, and then get on our private plane, and then we start heading onwards into the Pacific. And where we're going is part of Chile, of course, is the island off the coast of Chile, uh, which is uh, Easter Island. Uh, they've got a great, it's a very small island. They've upgraded all the hotels, or not all the hotels, several of the hotels. Every one of these stops we go to, we usually stay at the best hotel there is in this area. It's all pre-booked. So the, uh, Easter Island is this big volcanic island. I think everybody's heard of the cultures that built these great moai. 
And, uh, and then the explanation is how did they, why did they sort of uh, die off? Is it culturally induced, environmentally induced? So we spend the day touring all of these. There's about 400 of these large stone heads. It's, it's gorgeous. We have evening tours, uh, morning tours, all of these places, by the way, they give you the opportunity if you want to go for a sunrise or sunset photo op, uh, they arrange that. If you don't want to go, you can stay in. It's actually recommended, even though it's all, you know, a luxury trip that you actually take a break every once in a while, because there's so much to do. People get carried away. They want to see everything. Uh, they have these surprises. We, it's not a trip if you want to go on a diet or if you're trying to give up drinking. So they do these things such as we were touring all day and then they set up this tent for this exotic lunch. We had a local beach barbecue with local cuisine. And, and again, it's all set up. We drive in, you eat, you drink, you get on, you, you know, there's no dishes to do. They dismantle the camp. We go back to our hotel. And in, there's always evening performances uh, everywhere we stay in each one of these countries, local cultural performances. Uh, as we start flying west, we stop in Samoa only because uh, it's a fuel stop. But it's a great place to be because it's a Polynesian island. So they picked a great spot to visit. So we stop for fueling because it's such a long distance all the way to Australia. We spend uh, two nights there. Um, and we do some local tours for, you know, the Robert Louis Stevenson's museum is there because he spent so much time. Uh, there are other tours to the women's center and things like this. So this is one of the tours. Some people just hung around by the pool. Uh, in the evening, we had a, a special dinner, Polynesian dinner with performers, uh, you know, the fire dance. And so again, these are, private. We have entire areas blocked off. We're not sharing this with, with the general public. So these are put on when we're ready, when we show up for dinner. Uh, everything is timed to us, by the way. So there's we're not on anybody's schedule except our own trip schedule. We left uh, Samoa, then we keep heading west to the uh, northeastern corner of Australia. We land in Cairns and, uh, and we stay in, a, in our resort near there. There are a couple of day trips to go look at animals, private tours again, private animal viewings, uh, whether we go to a, a game reserve or a museum, they're, they're always closed off just for us. Uh, but the main reason everybody goes there is of course to see the reef. Uh, so we go out in this large catamaran. There was only about uh, 60 of us, including the, the sort of support staff but these vessels hold about 150 people. So again, there's nobody else on board, the entire boats for us. They take us out to the dive site. Uh, they take us out snorkeling or diving if you like. There's semi-submersible um, uh, subs. Basically you crawl in and you can go around the wharfs without getting wet and still see what's underground. And then, so that's really the highlight of that aspect. We go back and then we started flying northwards towards Cambodia. And Cambodia is a really interesting place. It's opened up in the last several years. Tourism is just doubling, I think, every year. Uh, I, I think it was about 15 years ago, they were getting about 100,000 people a year. And now it's in the millions. And uh, there, of course, they're known for the, the, uh, the temples. It's, it's really the, sort of the world center of temples. And the most famous, of course, is Angkor Wat. It's the world's largest religious center. And it's a World Heritage Site. Um, so we, we break up into our smaller groups. We toured about there. We had some uh, ground tours as well the next day. You, you've probably seen these examples of these large trees that have sort of grown over the temples, these sort of strangling uh, fig trees or something. I think it was made famous with uh, Angelina Jolie as, uh, in one of her movies they, they filmed here, of course. But they also booked, and I couldn't believe it, they managed to book this World Heritage Site for a private dinner. And so we, it closes at five and we got to go back in in the evening and they'd set up all of these candles and, and uh, evening dinner and a performance with this light show at this World Heritage. So it was just spectacular. Uh, and again, all the cuisine is obviously local wherever we go. Um, and then the chefs prepare the cuisine for the next flight. At, at a really nice hotel they've pre-booked. So they, they're in a nice hotel, they prep the food, they bring it on the plane, it, it hasn't been sitting anywhere. Uh, it's just amazing. So again, uh, you'll never run out of food or, or something to drink, it's, it's just great. 
and, as, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but you literally don't need money. Once you've paid for this, one woman actually came on a trip. She brought, she didn't even bring a credit card. Uh, so she said, well, I paid for the whole thing. And they said it's all inclusive. And it literally was. She didn't need any money. The disadvantage is she couldn't buy any tourist items because they don't give you that for free. So next we head off to India, and uh, which is Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is. Uh, this is a World Heritage Site too. We visited the Red Fort. Uh, now the interesting thing here, this is a great example. The average person, if you want to go see the Taj Mahal, is you fly to Delhi and you do a day trip. And I've done that. Uh, with my wife and myself, and it's an eight hour to 10 hour drive by car from Delhi to Agra to see the Taj. Then you either spend the night or you have to drive back. And there's a military airport at the Taj Mahal in a town called Agra, which we get to use. So we're literally half an hour out of town. We land at this military. So we have access to all the military airports as well, which are closer to all the sites rather than just the commercial ones. Uh, we get to mingle in with the locals. One year I was there, it was International Women's Day, so I went and mingled in. Just, did you know, you just blend right in if you want. You don't have to go on one of their organized tours. This, this is just a real treat to see the beautiful colors, the saris and everything that they're wearing. It's, it's really interesting. Then we head, uh, it's one of the longer trips. We go from India all the way to Eastern part of Africa. And uh, as I said, this year, or last year, sorry, in October, I got to go to the Ngorogoro Crater. Uh, they have a beautiful lodge right up on the rim. Uh, the uh, small group of us went who'd been to Serengeti before, but for the most part, people get to the flat area of the Serengeti. And uh, it, we've gone on several, I mean, on this trip, but as a family, we love going on safaris. You just can't do enough safaris. And these are great because uh, we, uh, you could go on your own safari, but what I really like about this trip is they throw in things like there are these morning hot air balloon trips. So you get up for sunrise and they take a group of about six or eight people per balloon and you float across the Serengeti early in the morning for two hours, uh, landing just in time for a champagne breakfast to see the animals waking up as well. It's just unbelievable. Uh, and then I'll explain some of the other perks of, in terms of the types of Jeeps and so on we use. I haven't shown you all of the local performances, but again, virtually every lunch or dinner, we get some sort of local cultural experience, which is fascinating. Uh, here we were treated again. You're out di all day really hot looking at animals, and then they, they turn around in the corner and they have this lunch set up for us. They had porta potties there. You can finally use a real toilet. There's cold beer and you know wine waiting for you. You have this spectacular meal, and then you leave and they put all that away, take it back to the hotel, and so on. It's just great. From here, we headed up north to uh, Jordan. And again, instead of uh, landing, most people use Amman, which is the capital in Jordan. Uh, we get to fly to uh, Aqaba, which is in the south near the Red Sea. And it's much closer, so we land there. It's a rarely used airport, and it's a quicker drive to Petra. So uh, Petra, uh, again, made famous by Indiana Jones and so on. It's an amazing uh, archeological site, another World Heritage site. It's the best example of what's called stone cut architecture. So you can see it's all chiseled out. Nothing is built. So there's no room for error. You know, you're building something. It doesn't work. You start building again. But when you're chiseling something, you know, oops, I cut off the left arm. The left arm is gone. And so these things are unbelievable uh, architectural features to see. Uh, this is that classic sort of gorge that you have to walk through, this seat feature. You walk through there. Again, uh, we have local guides. They're all vetted by the companies. Or, um, and they have these advanced teams I'll discuss uh, next that go out ahead of everybody to check everything out, make sure everything's OK before we arrive at each one of these stops. And then you walk around Souk. And of course, there, this is uh, a mortuary area. So a lot of these caves and so on, they actually used to bury the dead in. So when this site was discovered, all those were removed. But there were literally uh, upwards of 10,000 people uh, uh, buried in these uh, open sort of uh, uh, tomb-like features in, uh, at, uh, at this site. On the way back, we go through an area called Wadi Rum, also a World Heritage Site. That's where uh, Lawrence of Arabia was filmed. 
So we get to go through a little uh, for a Jeep tour through there and they take us off the large bus, put us in uh, private four by fours. The food, if you like Middle, East, Middle Eastern food, an endless supply. Again, we'd have these specialized dinners in, in uh, various restaurants or special hotels. And then finally, uh, as we're ending the trip, we went to Morocco. Uh, it's a gorgeous city. I think a lot of people have been to Morocco. It's fantastic to view. The highlight there, is, of course, is the uh, uh, the souk or the uh, basically where everybody goes to shop and you spend days there. There's also these fantastic galleries, the Jardin Majorelle. We had trips there. There was another banquet out in the, they took us out into the desert for an evening dinner. So I want to really quickly just go through these hotels to make sure people realize we're staying at the best hotels. So very quickly, we start off at the Ritz Carlton, the Belmont Palacio in Cusco. It's a, it's a 1500 square foot rooms. The Easter Island and Echo Lodge, brand new, it's just a two or three years old now. The Sheraton in uh, Appia, a Raffles Grand Hotel. The Raffles, of course, I think people know it's just, it takes you hours to walk through these hotels. Uh, the Oberoi in India, it's a great chain. Uh, again, I think it's five, six star hotel. They, you know, you show up and there'll be rose petals on the doorway as you're walking towards, <laughs> it's over the top. Um, the Four Seasons is a brand new hotel as well that they use in the Serengeti. A Moven Pick is across the road at Petra, so we don't even have to drive. We literally walk across the road. And La Mamunia in the Marrakesh, last time I looked, a couple of days ago, it's $1,500 a night to stay there. So I know they're not paying that, but we're staying in some pretty nice rooms. Local transport, so great buses. They make sure, they, as I said, there's always an advanced team. There's no surprises. They put about 10 people in one of these. This is the train we took from Cusco. It's called the Bingham Express. It's old school. It's like the blue train. You want to go in there, linen, cutlery, all this stuff. It's just great. We tried some mopeds in Cambodia because that's the transport of choice. So you don't get to drive them, but you're on the back. Sometimes it's horse and buggy. In India, we got to ride some elephants. We even got to play polo with some elephants. And then here's a great example in the Serengeti. Note here that there's two people per Jeep. So I've been on these, uh, these uh, tours in Safari where there's like eight, 10 people. So you can't see anything. So they make sure that you got lots of room to take photographs, you're not crowded. And you even have to ride a camel. So again, what are the advantages? Well, around the world trip, you know, take an extra 10 days. We're doing this in 24 days. So that's how much it just logistically it would take you longer to, to get to all these stops. We spend 73 hours, it would take you 112 hours of air time. That's the actual time you spend in the air going around the world. And then how much time in the airport? Well, check this out, nine hours in 24 days versus the average person having to show up. We don't show up three hours. We show up and we walk onto the plane. Lovely. Uh, they just wait at the gate, and then when we we're there, we just walk in and get on. So nine hours versus 84. If you hate airports like most people, this is what you're going to do. And then 15 flights versus 26, because we can do direct flights and around the world. And often, people, you have to do multiple flights to get to a destination. And uh, that just doesn't work. And then, as I said, that classic itinerary I showed you, those are about 90% of the trips. But I, because I've done six around the world, sometimes they've been a few different locations. So one, one year we got to go to Myanmar. So I got to go to Yangon and see these pagodas. We once went to the Maldives and I stayed in this uh, still, one of these still, this is 2000 square feet. We each had one of these homes for, for uh, <laughs> two nights, three days. Uh, uh, regrettably, I was by myself, so and I didn't see anybody for those two days. Everybody wanted to just enjoy these, the Maldives. So these are gorgeous, of course, and, and that's water, by the way. You just walk out and go swimming. And then uh, two times we went to Papua New Guinea, and that's a very hard place to get into. And we had lots of security, as I said. Uh, so was, that was just fantastic as well. So I've done these trips six times. And it's always because there's something new to see. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I think if you do the math, you'd see that it would cost you a lot more to try to do this on your own. They are expensive, 
but uh, you really do get to see a bucket list in a 24 day period. And it's uh, perfect for people who just haven't had time to get to a lot of different locations uh, or are still busy and don't have the time to say, well, yeah, I don't want to do this when I'm 80 years old. And uh, it's sort of hard to get to all these places because they're literally on every continent except the Antarctic. So that's it. I hope that's given you a sort of a taste of the pleasures of uh, doing around the world that uh, it really is worth it, I think. And so I'll just keep signing up as long as they have me do that. I can imagine you would. <laughs> yeah, that looks fabulous. I'm surprised that uh, that your wife let you go on five more after you did the first one. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm surprised too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky then. Yeah, <laughs> you so, are. So, Peter, you were mentioning earlier the age range. What What did you say about the age range? Yeah. So, well, this is good. So the uh, the I'd say the average age would be. Uh, Maybe 65 to 75, somewhere in there. Yeah, I'm bad at guessing age, but uh, you know, there's, so there's been people in their 50s and 40s, some young entrepreneurs. They're really busy. Want to do some? Uh, two young guys joined us on a trip this last year. They only came on half the trip. They paid for the whole trip, and they they met us halfway because he's a doctor in New York. He just didn't have time. But uh, so the age range is it's good. It's not they Obviously, it's not very young, but it's not very old. And, and uh, uh, you know, you have to have some mobility, of course, but there are people with canes, uh, you know, do they, they really try to accommodate everything. So that's the age range. And, you said and I think the other thing I should mention is it's there's a lot of solo travelers. Yeah. Yeah, so on the last trip, uh, 17 of the 57 uh, people were solo. And I think it's because of the, well, it's the ease, the safety, uh, you quickly make friends. Everybody's very nice on these trips. They're, uh, you know, they're well read. They, they love traveling. Uh, really interesting people, and and they're international. Uh, you know, we you get people. We've had people from uh, Asia, from the UK, from Italy, uh, Spain, Mexico. Uh, you know, a lot of people get on this trip because it really is. Uh, you know, they've done the work for you. Uh, mm -hmm. So do you have any other questions maybe? Um, who do we find that we can book this through? Well, it's for, so, for one of us at Departures. The Smithsonian, but uh, you, as, you as a travel agents at Departure uh, uh, consultants, you can do the booking for people, you know, and put them onto a Smithsonian trip. And what these are, the uh, these jets are usually made up of some alumni groups and so on. So, the Smithsonian doesn't fill the jet or whoever it is, or it, sometimes it's through somebody's university. There might be 12 people from Princeton, you know, 12 people from uh, another university and, you know, 25 people from Smithsonian and, and they fill the plane with a couple of groups. That's mm -hmm. how it's done. Much like on a cruise ship that, you know, different groups might send people. And so that's how that works. And it sounds like it would be um, fairly conducive to post-COVID travel because of, of being smaller groups. And it looked like from a lot of your pictures, there's a lot of space between people. I mean, two people on one of the safari vehicles is yeah. fantastic. So it seems like it, it will be, I can imagine this would be very popular, especially since we've been rather cooped up and not traveling for a while. I'm sure people are going to want to binge a little bit when they can well, get I'm going again. And what a way to treat yourself. I, and some of the people have told me that they, you know, they haven't, they've traveled a bit, but they basically set aside a little bit of money every year and they knew what this was going to cost. And they said, well, we just didn't spend as much every year. And then it didn't come as a shock to them that say, okay, well, we're going, you know, for, for such an expensive trip. But uh, uh, so that works out well for a lot of people, I think, mm -hmm. to do that. But I, I think it's what we what you don't know is there'll be things like for instance just they're small things but they mean a lot in every country when you land they give you an envelope with ten dollars worth of us of the local currency and that's you're not going to buy much other than a stick of gum or a postcard but you know you get somewhere and you think well you know i ran out of deodorant and now what do i going to use a credit card or you know what's, what's a, so they just give you that enough and some people don't spend it you just leave it as a tip but just that they're just sort of thinking of everything and all your postcards, for instance, people still do send postcards. They, at the airport, there's somebody standing there and you give them your postcard and they'll st put stamps on it and mail it. 
So <laughs> at every airport, there's somebody standing there and they get about 200 postcards from the passengers saying, okay, we landed in uh, Samoa. And, and you're not looking, well, what kind of postage do I need to send back to Canada or the US? And um, so, and then, you know, the visas and, and the going through customs, uh, it's just, we always, for instance, we use different gates at the airport. So it's, probably where the private, well, where all the private jets land. So the reason we don't see most, you know, Hollywood movie stars and politicians is they use another thing. That's what they use here on this trip too. We go yeah. in to a different part of the terminal. We go in through a different gate. We just walk in, we get on. So we, where possible, you, you're really uh, sheltered from, and that's, that's sort of the perk of that. Uh, the other thing is um, if for whatever reason, they have to change the itinerary, let's say there's something going on, we, we, we were on our way. The reason we went, for instance, to, uh, uh, we changed it to, uh, I forget which stop it was, oh, we got to go to Myanmar, is we were on our way to one stop and 24 hours earlier, they said there's some political issues, uh, you know, nothing to be afraid of, but we decided to cancel that. And they said, we're flying here. And so you just think, well, what are we gonna do? And, but they bought all the hotels are booked, all the buses are ready, all the tours are ready. That's because they have an advanced team that flies commercially two days ahead of you. They're checking out the logistics. When we land, they stay with us and they send another advanced team hopscotching. And so it's unbelievable that they've already checked, made sure the rooms are ready, that the buses are working, that all the local guides speak English and have their, and then there's no surprises. There's never been a bad surprise. And then having a doctor on board, I can tell you, he, the doctor, he or she, is invaluable. You, you happen to have forgotten your your pills for you know a malaria and so on. They're traveling with a huge suitcase, so that helps. It's always uh, they send a physician or one one of the doctors, emergency doctors from a uh, from Boston School of Medicine. That's the go-to place they use. So there's always a doctor on board, and and you know the chef becomes your best friend. The flight attendant within the first you know, leg of the nose that you like to have dry martinis or red wine before the, like, and, and then and I, I should add, after about two stops, people call the jet home. <laughs> so everybody gets back on, they're hugging the, the flight attendant saying, oh, we're so glad to be home again. And, and it's like you're home away from home while you're flying. You leave things on the plane because nobody else uses it. So you don't have to you know, stuff you put up top, you maybe don't want to take everything down of your little carry-on stuff. And so it's uh, yeah, it's really great. I, I, so, yeah. Well, that sounds uh, like I, I hope I do another 20 or so. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a fantastic trip. And I can't wait to do one. Me Good. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for the opportunity to explain this. Well, thanks so much for joining us. What a what a delight to have you on. You're very passionate about what you do on board, and I'm sure that they're really blessed to have you as a speaker. So hopefully, oh, Kathy and I, you and I might have to go check one out when Dr. Peter is um, on board and we can listen to the lectures and drink those martinis he was talking about. Great. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Sounds yeah. fantastic. Well, um, that's that ends up our today's episode on Departures Lounge. And uh, next week, we're having a delightful speaker, Chris David from Railbookers. And he's going to be talking about bucket list train journeys of the world. And I think it's interesting you referred, Peter, to um, one of the train journeys you were on. And I think he actually represents one of those as well. So Great. Um, we're looking looking forward to next week. We're always trying to have new and interesting speakers and we seem to be just getting better and better. So thank you so much for joining us. My and pleasure. That's it. We'll be signing off until next week and we'll definitely want to have you again, uh, Dr. Peter, to talk about one of your other journeys that you've been on. Thanks so much. Thanks thank again. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.